All right, welcome back. We were just talking, uh, Denver and I, one thing we have in common, we have a lot of things in common actually, but one thing is we never change our clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you for that joke, Denver. Uh, part three, part one, we heard about Denver's life uh, through story, really. It was a lot of different, uh, sort of chronological, a little bit disparate, but stories that led up to his conversion and baptism in uh, 1973 and the, into the Mormon church. And then we've talked a little about in part two about his uh, getting married uh, uh, to his wife of all these years, nine kids between them uh, and together. And then we, um, we talked about Mormonism and about sort of how he got the hook and yanked off stage uh, a little bit. And we talked about that in part two. So if you're just catching up with us today we're, uh, or tonight, we're going to talk a little bit more specifically. And I am begging for uh, truncated, succinct answers. Now, this is a man of words, and he's eloquent and intelligent. So intelligent that the empty, he, he, he just says things in a way that really paints the picture, but our low <laughs> attention span audience uh, doesn't necessarily always get that. So I'm hoping we can do this. Now, I have four categories. Okay. These are the categories, Denver. <laughs> Social issues, Mormonism, doctrinal basics, and Denver snuffer. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you choose the, the, the category. I have about 10 questions in each. That shows you how short you have to be. And I want to hear oh. what you believe, think, teach, share on the concept presented. Okay. Uh, what were the categories? Social again? issues. Nah. More, that would be last then. Mormonism. Sure. Let's do that. Thoughts on, first of all, Joseph Smith. Um, misunderstood, um, far more um, personally insecure than people make him out to be, far more respectful and dependent upon Emma than the LDS tradition would ever acknowledge, and um, in many respects uh, never felt comfortable with the role that he was assigned. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, and the brevity almost makes me cry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it does me too. <laughs> Brigham Young. Um, an ambitious man who managed to see in the construct that Joseph bequeathed him the potential for monetizing it in what we would call today monetization, who successfully developed it into... Um, an empire of control and dominion that today reflects far more the Brigham Young version of Mormonism than does it reflect the Joseph Smith version. Translation for our audience, he was a dude who saw an opportunity to make money. Yeah, he's the first multimillionaire west of the Mississippi. Excellent. And he, and he was a carpenter from New England. Right. It's like you elect someone to Congress and they come back 22 million in their pocket. Yeah. How'd that happen? Yeah. You make him church president and he becomes a multimillionaire. How'd that happen? So it's obvious uh, between Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, you see a lot going wrong. Joseph Smith had a pending petition in bankruptcy when he died. Mm. Brigham Young died a wealthy man. Mm. Yeah. Uh, priesthood. Uh, fabulously misunderstood, completely um, misused by the Catholic precedent to subjugate and to control that left so indelible an impression upon the minds of the Christian world that that abusive view echoes down right to today. Priesthood in the form that Christ exemplified it as a call to service and subservience and not a call to... Be what, served? Yeah, what, what we've turned it into. Mm. It, it, priesthood is synonymous in my mind with abuse okay. and primarily male abuse. Uh, 
Okay. So uh, just curious, just to take that out a little farther, do you believe in a priesthood, which is based or exemplified in service, uh, that both men and women uh, bear? I've redefined the concept, and I, I, you don't read what I've written, so you wouldn't know this, but I've redefined the concept of priesthood as fellowship. Okay. I think women can have fellowship with one another, and that's a form of priestesshood. Men can have fellowship with men, that's a form of priesthood. Men can have associations with angels, that's a form of priesthood. And I think the way to conceptualize priesthood in its best form is as an association between sisters or an association between brethren. Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, water baptism. I have heard, just to let you know, that you do perform these, and I've heard often. So water baptism. Well, water baptism, and I've said that I think having a living ordinance should be done in living water that you ought to go out into a river or a lake, a stream, a body of living water in which nature created it, not going inside a building in a tile font and be baptized. I think living ordinances should be by immersion in living water, and it ought to be in a facility that God created mm. to remind us that this is something intended to draw us closer to God, mm -hmm. to be born again. Anytime you find living water, as you come out of the water from baptism, you see new life. Mm -hmm. You see the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom. Um, I believe in baptism by immersion, and I think it ought best be done in living water. Okay. A uh, couple things. One, I'm sure you know that the earliest church fathers believed in living water. In fact, that was one of the main things. Uh, but uh, the question I have is, can anyone do these? You believe in immersion? Can a, can a uh, teenager baptize a woman? Or, or, or? Yeah, one of, one of the things that I have recommended. In the, in the Book of Mormon, there's this example of Alma, who, who, who had been a servant in, a, in an unrighteous king's mm -hmm. court. He, they call him the wicked priests mm -hmm. of King Noah. He was one of the wicked priests. He, he gets converted by Abinadi, as you know. He goes out and he starts his own thing. Well, before he performs a baptism, he prays and he asks God for the authority to baptize. And he gets an answer that gives him the authority in answer to prayer to baptize. I've recommended before you baptize anyone, pray and ask God to give you the right to baptize and get from God, as Alma did, the, um, the yay, the yes, and then perform baptism. And yeah, anyone. So also oh, anyway, so... Uh, what you have done there, and I love this, the campus stands for Christian Anarchists, and I don't want to go into it, but I love the fact that you leave it in the hands of the person who says, the Lord has said I can. Yeah. And you've let them take that responsibility on, because ultimately it's between them anyway. Right? Yeah. yeah, in fact, the more you can push responsibility onto the individual, yeah. and the less you try to aggregate power to mm -hmm. yourself, it, it, it's a toxin. It's a toxin to the person getting it, and it's the, a toxin to the person that is giving it. Mm. People need to be responsible to God directly. Mm, I love that. Man. Love that. Beautiful. Uh, Sabbath day. Um, yeah. Dude, that, that would require an hour of talk. <laughs> to, <laughs> Come to, on, you can summarize it. I, uh, we're commanded to keep the Sabbath day holy. I recommend that you do something on the Sabbath day always to remember God, and if you find yourself in a predicament where due to the circumstances of life, you're doing things that you would rather not do on the Sabbath, then do them cognizant and remembering God. Mm. You can serve God mm. even if what you do on the Sabbath is work as a mechanic. Mm. Just do what you do for the benefit and the glory of God. Yeah, from the heart. Do you, uh, is the Sabbath day, and I don't want to belabor this, are we talking about Friday night to Saturday night? Are we talking about Sunday? That's the problem because that requires a long explanation. But I, In you, it doesn't I'm, matter? I'm content with Sunday, Sabbath. I understand why some would say it ought to be on, sa on Saturday. I believe that the answer to the, to the question goes all the way back to the fall and how everything got pushed forward. Mm. And I think Christ's resurrection on what had become the first day of the week was really restoring the early fall 
Oh, okay. Because they didn't have the Sabbath at the beginning. They were kicked out of the garden. And the Christ's resurrection authorizes the celebration of the Sabbath on Sunday as okay. opposed to Saturday. But look, keep a Sabbath day a holy. Sabbath. Yeah. So we could say you're Sabbath fluid. I'm Sabbath fluid. <laughs> okay. Uh, that sounds cultish. <laughs> yeah, well, we have gender fluidity. I figure yeah. we can have Sabbath, Sabbath fluidity. Sabbath fluidity. All right, tithing. Um, God, just give it to me straight, brother. I believe that you have a responsibility to care for yourself, to care for your children, to care for your wife, and that it, the payment of tithing is, is not to be done before taking care of everything that's necessary for food, shelter, clothing, medical care, education, that whatever is left over, you tithe on that. Okay. You don't tithe on your gross. Got it. Yeah. Appreciate that approach far better than the evangelicals in this valley who pitched the old LDS struggle and the Lord will bless you. Give us the money you would have paid on your electric bill. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Just... And, and God gave you the money to use for your electric bill. <laughs> yeah. And you're using it to support. Yeah. Oh, it just, yeah. it makes no sense. Word of wisdom. Um, okay. The word of wisdom was not given in defined terms. It was given in colloquial language. The word of wisdom had no meaning until the high council at Far West mm. interpreted what they thought the word of wisdom meant. Mm. At a later time, Hiram Smith was asked about the meaning of the word of wisdom, and Hiram Smith, respectful of the order of things, repeated what the high council at Far West had said. I believe the word of wisdom actually recommends beer, Barley drinks, sure. mild barley drinks. What's it talking Whatever. about? Yeah. At that point, it meant beer. Mm. I believe that hot drinks are not coffee, tea. I believe hot drinks are what people at the time, we now identify this as an Indian word, mm. fire water. I believe that what it's talking about are those drinks that when you take bourbon or you take oh. some hard liquor and you drink it, mm. it burns your throat. Mm, I've never heard of that. That's, I think that's, that's the, the, the hot drinks is referring to hard alcohol. Wow. Wine in the sacrament is commended. It's the only liquid that's mentioned for use in Scripture. Mm. Wine for the sacrament. Mm -hmm. And I believe that um, beer is just fine. Mm. I think hard liquor is um, probably hazardous. Mm -hmm. In uh, A good friend of ours died from liver failure. Sure. And you, it would be very hard to accomplish that with beer. Yeah. But you can certainly achieve that with vodka. So uh, would it be safe to say uh, that you really don't appreciate hard alcohol based off the word of wisdom, but do you give the liberality of people who are participating? It's a word of wisdom okay. yeah. that is given not by commandment or constraint. Right. I think it's unwise, and I think I know from personal experience in my youth that hard liquor tends to make one act foolishly. Yeah. 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 My not, father, not me, but everybody else seems yeah, to. Yeah, my father and Wayne Waters' father met for the first time uh, after the two of us had been picked up. He, Wayne was guilty of a DUI. Mm. I was just along for the ride. But um, yeah, hard liquor will make one behave foolishly. Russell M. Nelson. Um, I, and, and I have to put a rule on this. You don't get to say, quick. Yeah, no. Look, um, I think he's the victim of a system mm. that he inherited that he does not see any way to execute his role other than in conformity to the system that he inherited. Mm. And he would be far, far better off if he said, the system is not the gospel. The gospel is not necessarily confined. We do not need to be slavishly following an order of things. The truth will set you free. And tradition, in the Book of Mormon, tradition is a negative. Sure. Every time the word tradition is used in the Book of Mormon, it is used in a negative way, except 
on I think two and it may be three occasions mm -hmm. where it specifically identifies a tradition as being good. Otherwise, the default for tradition is always evil. Russell Nelson is leading an organization that, that has been out of control probably since 1890. Um, and I picked that day because that was when the lawyer wrote Official Declaration 1 that Wilfred Woodruff published in order to satisfy the Tucker Edmonds Act mm -hmm. and to extract the uh, church from the loss of their property. You can't serve God and mammon. Mm -hmm. And right now, a lot of hard choices ought to be made. Mormonism would thrive if they made the right choices, mm -hmm. if they were willing to lay aside the traditions and the things that, that cultivate and curate the wealth Forget about the world. The world's headed for destruction anyway. Ooh, I have to talk about that. The more you hold on to that, the more disappointed you're going to be at the outcome. But the things of eternal life, they'll be with you forever. Last one, communion. Oh. In the sense of the sacrament, uh, sacramental communion, um, I believe that that ought to be celebrated every Sabbath, but as often as someone feels inclined to do so, mm. and that it ought to be breaking of bread, the taking of wine. And I, I think that wine was intended to be part of the sacramental observance because a little bit of wine for most people will put you in, in a more meditative state, mm. in a more reflective state. Um, we're very harried in our every day. Our minds are busy running from place to place. We have short attention spans. Wine has a way of slowing you down a little and letting your attention span expand a little and your reflection become a little more deep. Mm. I think communion in that sense, I see no problem if someone wants to have communion celebrated as a sacrament every day. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's a, there's a communion between people, a fellowship, a, yeah, a, uh, a sharing of ideas. There are a lot of things that everyone holds in common, and there are so many things that we can fight about. I don't think we please God when we decide, ah, what we're going to talk about today is what we fight about. Yeah. There ought to be a lot more. Used to be they invited uh, ministers to come to the tabernacle mm. and to preach in the tabernacle to a Mormon audience. D.L. Moody. Yeah. Yeah. Vanderdonk, the chaplain of the United States Senate. Wow. And B.H. Roberts. Wow. They gave lectures. Did that happen there? Yeah. That's where we get the, the yes. Vanderdonk? Yeah. Yes. That's from On tabernacle. Materialism? From yes. Wow. That that's tabernacle. Yeah. yeah. There was a time when Mormonism was confident enough that it would allow someone to come in and criticize. Mm. Mormonism today has no confidence no. to let a critic come in and criticize because it scares them. Yeah. Just as an aside, I don't know yeah. your age. Uh, you look r young, but gray. But the question I have is, do you remember the days when priests did meeting? I was really, a, I was a kid. I was about eight. But priest did, opening priests did meeting was it like a debate. I don't like that candidate. And the other person would say, oh, I, yeah. I think he's great. And yeah. they, they were open. It was, it was lively. See, what, what happened is that um, Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie, his son-in-law, wanted to stabilize Mormonism. Mm -hmm. I think they were far less concerned with getting it right and far more concerned with just stabilizing it. Mm -hmm. They were opponents of that, wow. and, and I, I loved that era. Yeah, that was a great era. That was fun. That ends your first category, Mr. Denver Snuffer. We have the basics in doctrine, yourself, or social issues. Wait a minute, are we going through all of them? Yes! Well, I chose this one. This is interesting. I chose one in the expectation that that would be it. Your expectations were incorrect, sir. So this is, <laughs> this is all double jeopardy. This is all... Yeah, we don't we don't ring the bell and say, okay, you've made it to the no, end of the No, we knocked three times, remember? Yeah. <laughs> Man. So what was the first one? Because we may as well do Social that. Social issues. That's the one I like least. So yeah, let's go there. Marijuana. It's funny. One of the fellows who was going to meet me here uh, 
is not here because he has to harvest his marijuana crop. <laughs> he has a license. This is this is weird, okay? He's he's he lives in Utah. He's been licensed by the state of Utah to grow a crop of marijuana, wow. which he has grown and is now harvesting because it's supposed to snow tomorrow. And um, he's going to he's gonna turn it into CBD oil mm -hmm. that's legal. And um, how weird is that? That is weird. I mean, seriously. Um, look, I... Uh, Herbs? I think, yeah, I, I get all that. But I think smoking stuff is ill-advised to your, to your lungs. Um, you know, edibles over in Colorado might be an answer for some people. Uh, I do think that there's therapeutic, um, there's therapeutic uses of a whole variety of things. Mm. I learned um, from a fellow whose daughter's in med school uh, that one of the very first uh, heart medications that they developed mm. for uh, blood thinning came from using um, a poisonous snake venom mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to adjust it for uh, dosage that will allow the blood to be thinned mm. in order to help uh, heart patients prevent um, further damage. Mm. Uh, if snake venom can have a therapeutic use, then it's likely that just about everything in the hands of someone that knows what they're doing can have a therapeutic use. We react hysterically because someone abuses something without ever considering that um, maybe further use ought to be experimented with to find out where it fits. This creation was fine-tuned by God who put man as the culmination of that creation and everything everything was given for the use and benefit of man in the Garden of Eden. Now when he was kicked out the kind of environment became progressively more hostile. But that doesn't mean that everything in the garden didn't exist sure. for the use and benefit of man. We just abuse stuff. Like your views. Yeah. Really do. Uh, government. The United States has one of the greatest governmental structures ever created. And it is populated at present by scoundrels and knaves and dishonest and just wretched individuals. Fortunately, we have egomaniacal leaders occupying all three branches of government, which is exactly what the Founding Fathers anticipated would happen. And so we get a daily uh, vaudeville show. Yeah. I mean, it's slapstick humor what's going on back in Washington. Yeah. Are you telling me that that both political parties don't realize there's an immigration problem that could be solved? Why are we why are we ignoring a problem when we're importing disease? Why can't someone that has a disease that would like to come here go through a system that welcomes them but cures their disease before they set them loose? in the general public. Some people say, well, we want to welcome them. And some people say, oh, this is a danger. We have to have it regulated. Why can't we both welcome them and regulate it and do it in a way that protects the people that are here and aids the actual people that are coming in? Our government right now is utterly dysfunctional and we're the beneficiaries of that because they leave us alone. So you have uh, obvious ideas. Let me get more to the point on that one government. What is your thought on the separation of church and state? Uh, it was always intended that the, the state not be allowed to meddle in the church. But I think that churches were always expected to speak up mm. and to have a voice. I, I think churches ought to speak up. Mm. I think there are a lot of issues that affect churches and the values of the churches. Mm. I mean, when you say that you have to gag the churches, then are the only voices that are permitted in the public discourse the, the secular voice, the, 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 the atheist voice? Mm. Why is the atheist voice more pure and worthy of being heard 
than the religious voice if, if um, you're going to open up the First Amendment for everyone to speak. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it makes no sense. We've, we've skewed it. Churches should be as vocal as they want to be. Atheists should likewise be as vocal as they want to be. The only thing that shouldn't happen is that a government should not say, this religion is destined to prosper and succeed, but that one is destined to ruin and taxation. They, they should be hands off. The government shouldn't control that. Got it. But if churches have the ability to win the political argument and to elect people to Congress that represent their views, churches should have the right to rally and to elect. With the continued support of tax-exempt status? I, th I think so, because anytime you do, anytime you say you will forfeit your tax-exempt, the power, Oliver Wendell Holmes said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Mm. The power to destroy when it comes to churches, you really have to take a tax-free mm. approach. Got you it. just have to. Otherwise, government can destroy. I see. Excellent. Uh, abortion. I think I know where you're going to say on most of these, but let's just get it on the record. Yeah, I think um, you're taking life. Okay. Homosexuality. I think it is uh, the... Ultimately, anyone who does not have children, I don't care what their orientation is, um, having a, a um, sexual union between the man and the woman that produces a child, no matter what it is that um, drives your libido, is part of what it means to be human, made in the image of God, and to experience in this life part of what is our destiny. Okay. And therefore, I understand that there may be people who find that challenging. Nevertheless, I think they will find greater joy and happiness in having and raising a child. Mm -hmm than they can in a union that will deprive them of that. Got it. So, I mean, I, I don't want to throw rocks at anyone. What I would like to do is encourage them to contemplate the value and the, the godliness of the union of the man and the woman and the, the, the product of progeny. Got it. Yeah. Uh, capital punishment. Because I have been a lawyer and seen um, innocent people be convicted, some, at least one fellow is in jail right now for a crime he did not commit, that uh, we're doing what we can to try and change that. I hate to have finality like execution when you have the potential for error. If you know, if, if, if the person confesses, I don't have a problem with an execution. Although, if there's no proof to support his confession <laughs> yeah. and all he's doing is using you to commit suicide, I got a problem with that. But there's a, there's a serial killer I heard about driving into work today. Mm. Uh, he's confessed 90 to 90, yeah. yeah. And, and he's got proof and they found bodies yeah. where he said they'd find them. I don't have any problem with execution. That's no connection to blood atonement. Oh God! Just have to ask. Yeah. You got to clear up the. You got to clear up the the mystique, brother. Yeah, yeah. I think the whole notion of blood atonement is asinine. Okay. The Apostle Paul. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said he was guilty of murder. Yeah. I, I mean, the, the whole concept was yeah. you, you committed a sin yeah, that Christ. Yeah, Christ's blood can't reach, so we got to shed yeah. your blood. Right. Ah, uh, yeah, that's, I agree. that's nonsense. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll just throw this one out there. We'll end it with that one. Evangelicalism. Uh, a recent innovation largely depended upon the, con the, the con constructural framework that Martin Luther came up with, which itself was in a way to escape Roman Catholicism <laughs> without, you know... 
trusting that Catholicism's excommunication of you will consign you to hell. I mean, evangelical views were inevitable, and I think they are supportable mm -hmm. by the biblical text, but they are really recent. I mean, if the they evangelicals are, are the only ones that got it right, yeah. then we've got like 1,750 years of Christians that are consigned to hell yeah. because it didn't exist. Yeah. I mean, I, look, given the chaos of what Christianity came to in the wake of uh, Catholicism and Martin Luther and Knox and Calvin, uh, evangelicals are probably putting a better face on the ruin of Christianity than most. And uh, I have a lot, I harmonize with a lot of what the the evangelical um, world has to say. Not on my list, but just between you know you and I, have you done much reading of Erasmus? No, I, I, I should do that. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we have two categories left, my friend, and I know the one you're not gonna pick, yeah. unless you wanna get the pain out of the way. Uh -huh. We can do Denver Snuffer, or we can do The Basics of Doctrine. Well, let's do the basics of doctrine, and then aren't we out of time? No, I know you're hoping for that. We're not letting that happen. I need to. <laughs> yeah, you're good at that. <laughs> All right, God the Father. God the Father is clearly cross culturally recognized as an existent male deity that um, in Jewish tradition and in Egyptological depictions and in Hinduism offered the promise of a redemptive God son who would come to rescue mankind from a predicament. And um, I, th I think that God the Father in, in our current scriptures, biblical and Mormon, seems distant and disconnected. And yet, God the Son comes in and says, I do what the Father tells me to do. I'm a reflection of him. I'm here as his, essentially his surrogate. When you see me, you've seen the Father. And so we, we have this disconnect between us and the Father that Christ was trying to disabuse us of, mm -hmm. to try and make the Father seem just as loving, just as sacrificial, just as kindly as is the Son, and we've lost that. One of the fascinating things that Mormonism has is that Christ in the Book of Mormon repeatedly refers to things he's doing as what the Father told him to do, and in dialogues in the book, first books of Nephi, first and second Nephi, the Father's voice is actually heard. Mm. I mean, um, Bruce R. McConkie, when trying to stabilize Mormonism, says that God the Father never talks to mankind except to introduce his son. This is, actually, I think I can do that voice. This is my beloved son, this is called, in this whom is, I am is, well pleased. Okay. Hear ye him. Bruce uh, R. McConkie. But he's wrong because the Book of Mormon says, right, in the first person voice of the Father, a lot of things that aren't, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now, I could go on you about can, that, but, but quick, you seem to be growing impatient. Quick yes and no's. Quick yes and no. Uh, uh, body of flesh and bone? Glorified body. Okay. Glorified body of flesh and bone. Um, yeah. Within, yeah. Look, what when you, when you talk about Denver, that. Denver, yes or damn No. It would, ha in order to know the, the biology of a resurrected You're being. You're killing me, Smalls. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, but, thank yeah. you. But, yeah. yeah, King Follett discourse, once a man? Yes or no? Well, if you define Christ as God, absolutely God was once no, a man. No, I'm not talking about his uh, incarnation through Christ. I'm talking about the Father. 
Yes or no, darn it, come on. My mom is waiting for me for dinner. Is your mom still, you used to live in the basement. What's up with you, man? <laughs> is, this, is this religious gig so, so poorly paid? You think I would live in a basement? I live here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, well, I hope they shut down the... the it's the only time I get sleep the is when they do. plant next door. Are you going to give me one on that? God the Father wants a man, yes, no? Um... I believe that God has made it possible for people, as is stated in Revelation chapter 3, to sit on a throne as Christ sits on a throne with his Father, and that as a consequence, uh, the, the deification of man, which is an Eastern Orthodox preserved doctrine, is true. In terms of the genealogy of God the Father, um, you know, we can go... We can go round and round on that without ever getting an answer in the, in the King Follett discourse. Okay. But, yeah. Okay. No. I, you're too wily of, a, of an attorney to know how to just manipulate the hell out of me, so I'm jumping categories, and we're going like this down the, the thing. Are you a prophet? Uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, right. so everyone ought to be a prophet. Okay. So that would be a yes. Everyone ought to be. Are you a prophet in the sense of the missionaries going door to door and say, like unto Moses? No, I don't have a podium, and I don't have a tabernacle, and I don't have a temple, and I don't have an organization. Okay, less specifically, do you receive revelation for people? I receive revelation. For others. Uh, some people have thought what I had to say significant enough that they, they use it in their own lives. Okay. Do I have the ambition of trying to... Uh, lead uh, a group of people? If so, my ambition is to lead them to become prophets in their own right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Um, the next one, Satan. Uh, because of a revelation, I happen to know that Satan is a title, and what it means is accuser, mm. and we can be Satan, as Christ said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, when Peter was trying to convince the Lord that he didn't need to go undertake the sacrifice. And I think Satan is, is a role any one of us can occupy as soon as we want to become accusers of one another. And, you know, that, that, the opposite of that is what Christ talked about, loving one another. Okay. Yeah. So it's more of a principle, concept, rather than an, than an entity. I think anyone can become an accuser okay. and an adversary. And many people do. Hell. I think there is such a thing as torment and regret. But I think that the inflictor of that torment is ourselves. Yeah. So not literal flames. Not no, 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 flames. no, 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 no pitchforks, no uh, horned heads and pointy tails. and. That's only the Mormons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah. Total yeah. joke because people used to say we had yeah. horns. <laughs> Jeez, you guys at home, I know what you're thinking. Uh, anyway, have you seen Jesus? Oh well, yes, and a little bit of a description of that is given in the book that I gave to you. Okay, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, different from the angel or the angel of the Lord. Oh Lord yes, 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 yes. Very different. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you the head of this dispensation? Well. The way you define dispensation requires that you understand the term. Do I have a dispensation? Has the gospel been dispensed to me from heaven so that I'm not dependent upon something, including the words of an old book, to know God? Yes. Okay. Does that mean that now I get to run a multinational corporation? No. Uh, no. no. <laughs> I... Uh, I doing my best to try and preserve faith in Christ at a time when, because of everything that's going on in our current environment that is so corrosive, it is increasingly more difficult for people to have faith in Christ. But I know he's real, and I know that he, he died for the salvation of a fallen world, and I know that he's going to come to judge it and redeem it. And that between now and then, um, faith is going to be increasingly more difficult to hold on to. 
And I, I hope to do what I can to have people preserve their faith in him and stop squabbling with our fellow believers. Mm. Yeah. In the context of asking that question, Denver, it's that, G, uh, that Joseph was the head of that dispensation, uh, you know, where we have to pass through the Sentinels and you got to see him, Brigham Young and all that. Yeah. The question mm. is, can people enter into, and we're going to get to heaven next, but enter into heaven without your approval? Yeah, well, I would hope. Yeah, I would so hope so. So would I. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you never know on this day. Some people might say, no, they've got to come through me. I, I just want to know. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. That, to me, that's kind of a silly notion. Is it? Um, so I mentioned before uh, St. Francis. Yeah. And that the current pope took the name of St. Francis, and that endeared him to me. St. Francis believed in the Sermon on the Mount, and he wanted to start a Catholic order in which they lived the Sermon on the Mount. He was initially turned down mm. because the Pope didn't think anyone could do that. Mm. And so he went out and he got a group of followers, and they lived the Sermon on the Mount, and they came back, and he got his order. When St. Francis was dying, in his final illness in the last weeks of his life, he said angels came and ministered to him, okay? Um, Joseph Smith's older brother, Alvin, died. As Alvin lay dying, he was talking about the angels that had come in the room and were ministering to him. Those two illustrations are, are what I believe happens with with the Christian journey and the Christian redemption, there are a lot of people who live very good lives who in the waning, um, when, when, when they were stoning Stephen in the book of Acts, Stephen is standing there in the final moments of his life mm -hmm. being brutally slain. And he says, the heavens open to me and I see the son of man on the right hand of power. Sure. He, he beholds the heavens open. These are the kinds of people that die with a firm expectancy that they have salvation because something occurred before they departed. Mm. A lot of people think that that's an event that needs to occur in the life of a Christian mm. soul when they're 14 years old or 12 or 50 years. Mm. I think for most people, they do have that experience, but it's in the waning moments of life. Oh. And I think that a lot of people experience that here in order to have the right to inherit it there. And some of that last minute babbling that you hear from the dying souls or the, the mentally impaired that are talking about babblings that sound religious, there's something more going on. Mm. And I, I think God's mercy extends far and wide and is experienced by many, many souls outside of the confines of denominationalism. Totally agreed. And yeah. that's a beautiful, hopeful uh, thought that you have. Yeah. Uh, second coming. Two. Uh, and absolutely... That's a thumbs up? Yeah, it's an absolutely firmly predicted, inevitable event. If everything that was said in Scripture concerning our Lord and concerning the prophecies that have been and are being fulfilled are true, then without any doubt there will be a second coming. And Christ will come to take possession of this world that he created. Okay. Belongs to him. Right. Going to reclaim it. Right. Yeah. Um, do you subscribe to the highest degree of the celestial kingdom or the three kingdoms part of your theological makeup? I believe in the idea of progression. Okay. I believe in the idea of being added upon uh, yeah, there's a lot more to that story than just, and the idea that you're going to finish this world, you're going to depart, you're going to arrive somewhere, and uh, that's where you get to, you know, build your condo on the beach and remain forever. Have you ever read Mark Twain's uh, short story? An, act, an extract from Captain Stormfield's visit to heaven? I don't believe so. It's freaking hilarious. Mm. 
and it's pretty good. Tough to read it. It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, a couple more and we're done. Uh, are you a cult leader? You have to have heard that from somebody. Well, it's, it's actually kind of silly when you think about it. What, yeah, look, I say what I say openly. I advocate in favor of faith. I advocate in favor of truth. Um, I don't think that history should be skewed in order to prop up a false proposition. I think that sometimes the study of history is painful and requires you to you know, come to a reckoning about what's going on or what went on. And um, I, I don't doubt that you can, if you define the term carefully enough, say that I lead a cult or that you lead a cult mm -hmm. or that, that Mormonism is a cult or that uh, the Roman Catholic Church is a cult. But in the, in the sense that there's some kind of secretive, right. um, you know, sexually aberrant, right. uh, uh, criminally deviant, uh, that all of those things usually go with the idea of uh, cultism. Uh, no, that I try to be as open and as forthright and as forthcoming as I possibly can be. I do... Um, speak very little about the miraculous and the, and the otherworldly because I think it attracts the wrong kind of people. I would rather teach in order to have people have their own experience mm. and to enjoy their own communion with the heaven. Mm. And then they've got it for themselves. They don't, they don't need me talking that stuff up. I think talking that stuff up... Um, it really skews people's perception of you, the way they interact with you, and it limits their own growth. That, mm. They need to grow. Mm. Everyone needs to become prophets in their own right. Yeah. Yeah. One last question. With uh, it, it uh, it's, uh, tags on to that last one, because and I thank you for answering it. It's, it's, it's not, I hate it, because you get called a cult leader if you do anything, anything. They just, you're a cult leader. But the, the question is, typically, in, historically, we see that leaders of groups, they fall to gold, uh, glory, or girls. Uh, that, that's, you know, we've seen that historically through almost every group. Almost everyone, they fall to one of those. And I don't think you're having the problem with the girls, and I don't think you're having the problem with the gold, at least as far as I know. But the glory, are people allowed that are in your group to disagree with you and remain uh, loved and can someone be with because like here we have people who say you know Sean you're crazy I don't believe that and we say so what stay here <laughs> is it you have that same that same approach yeah and in fact um, there are a lot of things that go on that I disagree with and I just hold my tongue mm. there there are things that get discussed that um, I know if I weigh in, I can get my way. And I think that's bad for me, and I think that's bad for them. Yeah. Um, I have a very different view of what Joseph Smith was and what he accomplished than most ex-Mormons. I think the trajectory of Joseph Smith's life, he died at age 38 and a half. He was still a young man. When you go back to one of the letters that you'll find in here is the one he wrote from Liberty Jail. You have this, you have this priesthood, structure, control, hierarchy. You have all of this stuff being constructed in the, in the religious development that Joseph Smith undertook. Then you have things literally fall all apart at Far West. Mm -hmm. Uh, three witnesses abandoned him. Members of the Quorum of the Twelve abandoned him. Um, members of the Quorum of the Twelve signed affidavits that helped put him in jail. The hierarchy had, had been decimated by opposition and infighting, and he wound up in jail because of that. He's in jail, and he's writing a letter. And in his letter, he puts something that completely reverses 
everything that had gone on before. No power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by gentleness and persuasion and pure knowledge. Joseph Smith's arc, which tended towards the authoritarianism, began to be dramatically reconsidered during the imprisonment mm -hmm. in, in Liberty Jail. What he wrote in there absolutely eviscerated hierarchical control. Mm -hmm. And when he gets to Nauvoo, and he gives the talk to the Relief Society in Nauvoo, he says, you are depending too much upon the prophet, and you are darkened in your minds because you're neglecting the duties that devolve upon yourselves. Well, if we're students and we're careful students of history and we can see what's going on in downtown Salt Lake right now, mm -hmm. and we know that that's not going to yield the kind of righteous, um, self-sufficient, self-confident Christian souls converted to a living faith that would go to their death because in their hearts they harbor the conviction that what they're doing and what they're living is in fact pleasing to God. Then you can't, you can't take away from people and aggregate to yourself the authority or the control. The, the thing I try consciously and that I've asked my wife and she tries constantly to remind me of is it is not a virtue or an advantage to be the one in charge. Mm -hmm. It's a virtue and it's an advantage to be down laboring alongside and helping lift others. Mm -hmm. It's an advantage to try and teach and preach in a way that will make them better people for your having been there. And if you manage to move people along so that they can reach a state of harmony that we would call Zion or a city of peace, mm -hmm. and you're not there, but you help facilitate it, then you've done something for which God will, will give you what you're due, whatever that may be. You trust him, you leave it in his hands. But to say, I need to be the mayor mm -hmm. of Zion, is it's Nauvoo all over again. Sure. Joseph Smith's experiment in restoration efforts to try and bring about the kingdom of God, mm -hmm. the Lord's Prayer asks that his kingdom return, mm -hmm. didn't work. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. And the Book of Mormon says, this land shall not have kings on it. I don't want to be a king. I would love to be a servant in the service of the Lord and to elevate others. I've really enjoyed this. I have a new appreciation for you as a, mm. as a person and your thoughts. Uh, I think they're great. I think they're, uh, if they are what, they, what, they, what you claim them to be, you always have to add that caveat because I don't know you personally, but in terms of what you've communicated, it's been excellent. And uh, I think you give people hope. You seem to want to help them to stand on their own two feet to know the Lord yeah. and walk with Him in that way. And I really appreciate you taking the time all this time to do this. Thank you for the You books. bet. And uh, yeah, you'll, you'll probably figure a lot more out about me and those, particularly the essay books. And let's not do this again. All right. Okay. <laughs> we will not. Uh, but I do have one favor, a message for the audience. That's the camera. They really want to see you. What do yeah, you have look, to say? There is absolutely no reason to be afraid of the truth. The truth will not harm whatever you're doing. And that includes what's going on in downtown Salt Lake. It may require that you change the nature of the message, but the truth will not harm you. The more of it that you can deal with, we, we tend to think that the opposite of faith is um, hatred. It's not. The opposite of faith is fear. Fear is what produces a lack of confidence that produces evil and hatred. Fear. Stop being afraid of the truth. Christ said, the truth shall make you free. And he meant that. It's true. You don't need to carry the burden around of trying to hide or conceal or mislead. Just be forthright, honest. And the fact that you're a weak man 
all of the heroes of the Old Testament were weak men. We don't lose our faith in God because David betrayed one of his generals, ultimately sending him off to be murdered in order to hide his adultery. We don't hide that. Our opinion of David is altered as a consequence, but our faith in God is not. The same of Peter, denying the Lord. That is not evidence that Peter wasn't commissioned and sent forth with the message. It just meant that he wasn't as strong as he would like to have been, or perhaps than we would like to have seen him be. But none of us are either. None of us have ever been strong enough to carry the burden that was necessary for our own redemption. That's what Christ did for us. So confessing your own inadequacy is simply another way of reminding us that we're all dependent upon the Lord. So be truthful.